verse if we think it's worth trying the next class we'll do it. Faith of the fathers living still in spite of dungeons, fire and sword. Oh, how our hearts beat high with joy when we're near that glorious word. Faith of our Father's holy faith, we will be true to Thee till death. Faith of our Father's we that's on our prayer list, let's keep them on our prayer list. And uh, does anybody in here recognize the name Dr. Robert McCurry? Pastor McCurry from Georgia. Well, he's, he and Dr. Dixon were the two leaders in the fight with me in Nebraska. And they've been in, in the pastor for years. Dr. Dixon died about a month ago. And Dr. McCurry and I was in the hospital Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for my wife, who is so much of a blessing to me and to the ministry. And thank you for the healing that you're bringing to her. And we pray for these others. We pray for Anna, and we pray for Ruby, and we pray for uh, Mrs. Lake. We pray, Father, that you would just continue to reach down and touch lives and bring healing. You're the, you're the physician. Doctors can't heal us. They can only facilitate your work. And Father, I pray that you'll bless us this day as we study the word and look at what's ahead. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now, I'm starting something a little different. How many of you, anybody in here does not have this book? This is my book on the prayer book. Everybody have it? Okay. Well, I'm, gonna, I'm starting a series to teach the parables. People can read the book, but teaching has a lot more information and has a lot more that goes with it. I'm not asking you to bring the book and follow along because that's probably not what I'm going to do. I'm probably going to teach them in a different manner in which I wrote them. But I, I think it's important that God's people know parts of the Bible that don't necessarily deal with race. It deals with everything else that we need to know about when we have a relationship with God. And I want to share the parables because the parables, in order to understand them, you have to understand what number one is, what God's plan is, and number two is you have to understand who they're written to. Now, I'm, as I've said many times, I'm 80 years old. I was ready to preach when I was 16 years old, so you can figure that out how long ago that was. And from the time I was 16, all the way up until in my 40s or 50s, I was taught the normal Christian understanding of the parables. And they always tried to apply it to the Christian life. And none of them ever made any sense to me. I didn't understand them. They didn't sound right. And when I left after the sermon, I was always leaving with, it was nice to be in church, but I don't think I learned anything today that will change my life. But when I understood what the parables were really alike and who they were to and what they were about, then they became alive and they made the rest of the Bible important. First of all, remember that the parables are prophecy. They're prophetic because every time that God did something, let's, let, let me give you an illustration. Let's say, Brother... Uh, Rob here, he's got kids that he still deals with. 
But the Sisley, his son, gets out of line and he has to, to, to straighten him out, which never happens, of course, but he, <laughs> it might happen. And let's say that he had to really get severe one time, maybe take his truck away for a while or something like that. That would really be severe, wouldn't it? And he's probably in his mind, he's probably saying, when is this going to happen? Does my father really love me? Does he really? Is, am I really? And that's the way God deals with his people. When he had to swap it really hard, and when he had to take Israel out of their own land and take them into Assyria, these parables that I'm going to start with were given by Jeremiah, who was not a prophet to Israel. He was a prophet to the house of Judah, which was down in Jerusalem. And Jeremiah is giving some prophetic parables to them. Why? Because, as always, the house of Judah was very, very self-proud. We're all God's got. Well, he's got Israel. No, nah, they're gone. They're gone. He divorced them. They're gone, and they're never going to be heard of. We're God's pet. We're God's special people. And so... Uh, Jeremiah was told of the Lord to go get all of the elders of the church and get all of the elders of the government, get all the elders and take them down and give them a parable. And the first parable that he gave them was the potter and the clay. So if you got your Bibles, I want you to turn in your Bible and go to Jeremiah chapter 18. Chapter 18, verse 1 through 10. And uh, I think it would be good if we read it together, read it out loud together. And uh, well, if you miss a word or two, don't worry about it. Uh, we just want, I just want you to get what's said. And uh, follow the, the, the punctuation. If you see a, uh, if you see a comma, that means you take a breath. All right, Jeremiah 18, 1 through 10. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, join in everybody, saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house. And there I will cause thee to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels, and the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again, another vessel, as seemed good to the potter to make it. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, Cannot I do with you as this potter, saith the Lord? Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in my hand. O oh, concerning a kingdom, O oh, house of Israel, I'm sorry, at what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck it up and to pull it down and to destroy it, if that nation against whom I have pronounced turn from their evil, I will repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. And at what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom, to build and to plant it, if it do evil in my sight, that it obey not my voice, then I will repent of the good wherewith I said I would benefit them. All right. So what is this? Jeremiah says to the leaders, you think you're the only ones. And he said, I want you to see this potter's wheel. And I want you to see the potter. The potter is God. And the wheel has clay on it, and that's Israel. Now, if you go to the Christian church today, and I've even used this approach with this message in the past, and I'm not going to say that it's absolutely total unusable, but it certainly does not stick with the definition of the parable itself. Most people, when they preach a sermon, I know that there's a famous preacher years ago, and he, I've got his sermon on the potter and the clay. And I mean, it's entertaining, it's good, it's, it's over two hours long, and, and he had lots of people made decisions to come to the Lord because of it. He was blessed with the Lord, but he, didn't, he never did say that this was Israel. He never did say that, the, he did say that the potter was, was God. But the, the normal way is that you become the clay. That's the way the preacher says. You're the clay. God's a potter, and he puts you on a wheel, and he's working on you. And uh, if you don't do right, uh, he'll mar you. He'll mash you. He'll hurt you. And then he'll pick you up again, and he'll start over again. And he'll make you into whatever he wants you to be. 
And of course, the message is we're supposed to yield to the potter's hand. But I want to give you the real, the real message here because I think it's important. Israel is in, they're in slavery. They're, they've been captured. They've been taken away from all of their possessions. They've been taken away from all of their families, away from everything. And they're in this, this land of Assyria, which is an ungodly country, and they're sitting there saying, uh, we want to go home. When are we going home? Who was their prophet? Ezekiel. Ezekiel was the prophet that lived among them. And they would say, when are we going home? And finally, he said, the Lord said, you're not going home. And, uh, and the Jews, or the house of Judah, down in Jerusalem, would say, see, they're gone. And we're all that's left. And Jeremiah is saying, I'm going to show you that God's not done with them. And he is going to be done with you. And we're going to cover that today. And so he brought this, this group, and they looked at this potter's wheel, and he said, that clay is the nation of Israel that you say is gone. And it says that as he made the clay, by the way, I, I, I don't know. I, maybe I'm not real smart, but pictures always help me. Passing that. Give everybody one of these. And uh, don't worry about the back side if we're not there. Just worry about the front side. But look at the potter and the clay. And the, the potter is God, and clay is the Israel. And God said, I started to make them into a beautiful pot. But something happened, and as you read the scripture, it says, it was marred, the clay was marred in the hand of the potter. Now, what does that mean? Thank you very much. What does that mean? It means that God actually marred the clay. How, has anybody in here ever make anything out of clay? You ever do a potter? Do you ever do that, Marie? Have you done that? And if you get... <laughs> You know, used to you had to go down and get your own clay. Now I guess you could buy clay and it's pure and it's nice and easy to work with. But used to you have to get your own. And you just start pumping that wheel and then going around and you'd feel something in there a little bit hard. It might be a rock or it might be a hard spot. And so you pinch it a little bit and it doesn't come out. You pinch it again and it won't come out. And you can't get it to straighten out. You can't get it to be soft. You can't get it to work. And pretty soon you just say, start over again. Marred in the hand of God. Israel, God at the Mount of Sinai began to mold the nation of Israel. And he gave them his commandments. He gave them his laws. He gave them all of the procedures and named the priesthood. And he named everything that the nation needed in order to serve God. But they never did really serve. They had a bunch of people who didn't want to serve God. They didn't obey God. They wouldn't live for God. And when they were told to go conquer the land, they turned back, and they were fearful. And so there were many times that God had to deal with them. But finally, when they finally got over into the land of Eden, and when they got into the land where they had their own nation, they separated from the house of Judah, and they set up two idols, and they worshiped their own gods. They did not worship the true God. And God took his hand, and he smashed them with the Assyrians and took them into another land. And then Jeremiah looked at these leaders of the house of Judah and says, that's not the end. Because we have here that there is going to be another time where God is going to take the house of Israel and he's going to remake it and he's going to make it into a vessel of honor. Now if you look at the picture on the last picture on the front page at the bottom, you see a pot with a crack in it. If you, if you make a vessel and you have something in the clay that's not supposed to be there, you will wind up with a crack pot. That's what you call them, it's a crack pot. And it won't, it won't be any good for anything. It'll be one of those pots you sit on a shelf and you throw pennies in and you put pencils in and rubber bands and everything else that you don't know what to do with. And you, they don't become the, the serving pot or the serving uh, vessel that you wanted them to become. So, when did he start with this re rebuilding? When did he do a remodeling after they had become marred? Well, that began, that it, was a prophet, it was a prophecy. It was a hope for Israel. God was saying to them, it's not over. Just because I threw you out into Assyria, it's not the end. We're going to make you. And he remodels, he restarts his remolding of them 
with the Holy Spirit. Well, when did the Holy Spirit show up on the scene? The day of Pentecost. That's when he showed up. And so here is all of Israel gathered in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. And the Pentecost, the Spirit comes down. They're in, anointed with the flames of tongues of flames. And they began to speak and people heard in every language. And they understood. And they moved. They began to move into a new part of the world. The prophetic message had been removed from Israel until Pentecost. Now it was being replaced. It was being given back to them. Israel is still the clay. And I want you to know this today, is that as we stand here today in Mountain Home, Arkansas, we're a part of that clay. And he's working with us. Right now in the country of the United States of America, we are being banged and pressed and and, and, and where the hard spot is, is where we're going to have the problem. God is going to have to get rid of those hard spots and those rocks and those uh, twigs and everything that's in our uh, makeup so that he can work with us. Now, what I don't want you to do is I don't want you to spiritualize the parable. That's what all the churches do. The churches will spiritualize the parable and try to make it Christian. They'll try to Christianize it. Well, it maybe it can be to some degree, but it's really about the nation of Israel and the kingdom of Israel. Now imagine Jeremiah standing here, and he's told them all about Israel. He's looked at these house of Israel uh, Judites, and he said, you're not all God has. He is not done with Israel. So you people that are bragging about you're it, and God's not going to bring judgment on you because of your sin, you need to understand that you're wrong. You're wrong on that. And then we go to Jeremiah 19. So take your Bibles and go to Jeremiah 19. And we're going to read verses 1 through 12. This time I'll just let you follow along. Uh, maybe you weren't real comfortable reading then. It says, Thus saith the Lord, Go and get a potter's earthen bottle. Now turn your pictures over and you'll see an earthen butter bottle on the other side. And take of the ancients of the people and of the ancients of the priests. Now the ancients, they were the old people. They would be like me. <laughs> Anybody over 80 would be considered, I guess, ancient. And go forth into the valley of the son of Hinnom, which is by the entry of the east gate, and proclaim there the words that I shall tell thee, and say, Hear ye the word of the Lord, O king of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will bring evil upon this place, in which whosoever heareth his ears shall tingle, because they have forsaken me, and have estranged this place, and have burned incense in it unto other gods, whom neither they nor their fathers have known, nor the kingdom of Judah, and have filled this place with the blood of innocents. They've given their babies to Baal, burned in the fire. Molech. They have built also the high places of Baal to burn their sons with fire for burnt offerings unto Baal, which I commanded not, nor spake it, neither came it into my mind. Therefore, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that this place shall no more be called Tophet, nor the valley of the son of Hinnom, but the valley of slaughter. And I will make void the counsel of Judah and Jerusalem in this place. And I will cause them to fall by the sword before their enemies, and by the hands of them that seek their lives. And their carcasses will I give to be meat for the fowls of the heaven and for the beasts of the earth. I will make this city desolate and an hissing. Everyone that passeth hereby shall be astonished and hiss because of all the plagues thereof. I will cause them to eat the flesh of their sons and the flesh of their daughters, and they shall eat one the flesh of his friend in the siege of, and straightness, wherewith their enemies and they that seek their lives shall straighten them. Then shalt thou break the bottle in the sight of the men that go with thee, and shall say unto them, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Even so will I break this people and this city as one breaketh the potter's vessel that cannot be made whole again. Underline that. They cannot be made whole again, and they shall bury them in Tophet, till there be no bury, place to bury 
Thus will I do into this place, saith the Lord, and the inhabitants thereof, and even make this city as Tophet. This chapter is about the house of Judah. And this, pot, this bottle that you're looking at is not like the clay. The clay was soft. The clay was uncooked. The clay was moldable. But this bottle has already been made, and it's already burned, and it's already heated, and it's hard, and it's not to be changed in any way. And that's the way the house of Judah had become. Here is shown a kingdom and a throne firmly established, and a bashed vessel completed and burnt hard in the fire. Compared with the northern kingdom of Israel, it would have, which had existed for 250 years, uh, only the, the kingdom of Judah had been around much longer. But the forces of disruption are asserting themselves, and the fact that the permanence of the house of David was on the throne could not stop it. So, so here's, we got this, we got this problem that we're facing. In this prophecy, God is saying to these people in Judah, not only is God going to bring Israel back and make them the head of things, you, you that think you're the head of things, you're going to be destroyed, and you're not ever going to be the head of anything. And that was quite a, that was quite a thing for them to accept that. And so when, they, when the Babylonians came down and they captured Judah, you know the story. If you go into Jeremiah and also you read some of it in Ezekiel and some in Isaiah, and you'll find where the, the, the Babylonians came in and they took the king and he took his two sons and they took them into Babylon and they were killed uh, and they were destroyed. And the king of Babylon was trying his best to destroy the king. The, the line of David, so that it could never, never rebuild the kingship of the, the land of Israel and the nation of Israel. And the sequel is known to many as historic fact. By 587 B.C., the house of Judah ceased to be as a nation. The king, princes, and nearly all the people have been carried away captive by Nebuchadnezzar into Babylonia. Now it will be asked, how could Jehovah carry out his sentence and at the same time be true to his promise? of permanence of the house of David. And we'll talk about that uh, in just a little minute. But I want you to see that in, in this picture, he has broken the bottle, and that's what he did. He, he threw the bottle down, and it crashed, it's, it's just scattered everywhere. And he said, now I want you to go pick up all the pieces and put it back together, and they said, it's impossible. And he said, that's what God's trying to tell you, is that you're gonna be scattered, and it's gonna be impossible. Well, let me ask you a question. Does the media today tell you that it's possible? Because they talk about Jerusalem and they talk about the Jews as being the returning of the house of Judah and of the, the house of Israel. Is that, is that true? No, it can't be, and this be true. If this is true, then that what they're telling us is a lie. And that's because it could not be done. And uh, there were 43,000 Judeans returned to Jerusalem after the 70 years. Of course. There are a lot of things took place, you know, either you, it was during that period of time that you had the story of Daniel who was taken, and Daniel was thrown into the lion's den, and then you had the Hebrew children that were thrown into the fire. And Nebuchadnezzar was, was treated like a, he became insane. He became like an animal that went out and lived in the, in the, in the field, and he, 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 he mowed, he chewed grass, and he ate with the animals, and, and people would have said, yeah, he's crazy. He's out there uh, grazing with the animals. And yet, during all that time, Daniel preserved his kingdom so that when he was sane and brought back, he would have his kingdom. But what about the house of David? And so I want us to uh, take a, a look, and I have another set of pictures. Yeah. I got lots of pictures this morning. Let's see if I can find them. What did I do with them? Uh, I just had them here, too. Sorry, David. I'm looking for my pictures, and I don't know what to do with them. Well, I guess I'll hold up one. This has eagles on this side, and this one has cedar trees on this side. So we're going to go from there. And I want you to take your Bibles, and I want you to go to... Uh, Ezekiel 17, 1 through 6. Ezekiel 17. Now, Ezekiel is the prophet 
to Israel. And when Jeremiah was... Anybody in here know what happened to Jeremiah when the Babylonians came in and took the city of Jerusalem and destroyed it? What happened to Jeremiah? Does anybody know? Yeah. What happened? He went there yeah, with them and uh, you know, given full run. And, oh, and then and where did he go? He, he took he he back to Egypt. Egypt. He went to Egypt. 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 Yeah. Egypt. Yeah. And he took some people he took some people with him. We'll talk about that. Ezekiel 17, 1 through 6. And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, put forth a riddle, and speak a parable unto the house of Israel. And say, Thus saith the Lord God, A great eagle with great wings, long wings, full of feathers, which had divers colors, came unto Lebanon, and took the highest branch of the cedar. He chopped off the top of his young twigs, and carried it into the land of traffic. He set it in a city of merchants. He took also the seed of the land and planted it in a fruitful field. He placed it by great waters and set it as a willow tree. And it grew and became a spreading vine of low stature, whose branches turned toward him and the roots thereof were under him. So it became a vine and brought forth branches and shot forth sprigs. Now in Ezekiel chapter 17, go down to verse 22, and through 24, thus saith the Lord God, I will also take of the highest branch of the highest cedar, and I will set it. I will crop off from the top of his young twigs a tender one, and will plant it upon an high mountain, an eminent. In the mountain of the height of Israel will I plant it, and it shall bring forth bows, and bear fruit, and be a goodly cedar, and under it shall dwell all fowl of every wing. Let me ask you a question. In the Bible, when the Bible talks about fowl in a, in a par parable, parabolic way, are fowl good or bad? Every parable that has fowl in it, the fowl are bad. And we'll see that in the New Testament too. So he's saying that this, this fowl is going to be planted and all the fowl of every wing shall come and the shadow of the branches thereof shall they dwell. And all the trees of the field shall know that I, the Lord, have brought down the high tree, have axed the low tree, have dried up the green tree, and have made the dry tree to flourish. I, the Lord, have spoken and have done it. Okay, so first of all, let's deal with the eagle. When you see this side of the eagle, there's an eagle. That was the, Ro that was the Babylonian eagle. Up here was the Babylonian eagle. This is the Roman government eagle. This is the Roman Catholic Church eagle. And this is the German eagle. So I've got all of these on here. And I know uh, today I'll give you a, I'll find this before you leave. I'll get, give it to you. Somewhere I have it. <clears throat> but he says, I am going to take, there is an a eagle that comes into the Lebanon, into the highest tree. That was Babylon. Babylon is coming down into Jerusalem. And it says, I am going to take him into the highest tree, <laughs> the cedar tree. The cedar tree is the picture, or is the parabolic picture, of the house of David. So here we have David, has long been dead, and his son Solomon, and then he had another son, and then another son. And now he's got a son, Zedekiah, who is king. And Zedekiah has two sons who would follow him. And so he is in the top of the tree. And the Babylonians come down and take the top of the tree and cut out two of the branches. Well, who they? The sons. They took the sons and he took them and he killed them because he did not want them to have any any kind of uh, legacy afterwards. Now, I believe Zedekiah was allowed to live for a while as long as he would bow down to the Babylonians and pay them tribute and as long as he would do what they wanted. So he was not his own king. And then we read in the latter verses that I read, God said, the Romans are going to come in and they're going to take two twigs, the sons. But he said, if you'll notice now, let's look at that passage again in verse 24, 22. God said, I also take of the highest branch of the high cedar, and I will set it. Well, who, who is he going to take? He's going to, there are no more sons. Those two sons are it. But he had daughters. 
David had daughters. Zedekiah had daughters. Jeremiah was actually an uncle in, in distant relation to them. And he took the two kings' daughters into his care. And when, uh, when the Babylonians came in, uh, Jeremiah said, Lord, what's going to happen to me? And just like uh, David said, uh, the king said, you're going to be fine. The Lord said to the king, I'm going to give the king the right to let you go. You can be free. You can do whatever you want to do. He took the two daughters and he went down into Egypt, which became uh, not, a, not a very good decision because then the Babylonians came down to Egypt and tore that place up, so he had to take the daughters and leave again. And he went back north and he went to the Phoenicians, who are actually the tribe of Dan, and they are, what, what is the tribe of Dan noted for? The ships. Ships. Traveling. 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 Ship Traveling. Traveling. Yeah. They, were, they were the explorers. Right. If we have any Danites today, they'd be the ones going to space, I guess, or wherever. But they were the explorers, and they had the ship. And Jeremiah, and who was his secretary? His secretary was Baruch, or Barak, however you want to pronounce Barak. it. Barak. Yeah, and they went to the ships, they got on the ships, and the ships went to Ireland. That's how they got there. And that's what God said he would do. Notice what he said. He said, I will take. He took one other thing with him too. He took the house of God. Okay. The stone. He had, he had the stone with him. Had the stone. Yeah. In the ark. Well, maybe. Maybe. But the stone. But the stone for sure. Jacob said he would call the stone the house of God. The house of God. <laughs> the house of, of the Lord. That the Lord said, I will take of the highest branch of the highest cedar and will set it. The word set it means like when you women, you, and like uh, Marie or any of you, that when you set out plants, you take a plant and you set it out to grow. And it says, I will also take the highest branch of cedar and set it. I will crop off from the top of his young twigs a tender one, will plant it upon the high mountain and eminent in the, in the mountain of the height of Israel. What in the Bible in prophecy? What is a mountain? It's a country, or it's a government seat of government. Seat of government. Yeah. So, all of these years from this time, when when the Israel, the house of Israel, went into Assyria, did they stay there for a while? But then, what did they do? Went across the Caucasus. They went across the Caucasus mountains, traveled into France. Italy, Spain, and then on into England and Ireland and Scotland, and eventually into the United States of America. They had countries. Think about this. Think about this. Who, who had led the way to those countries? Well, of course, Dan did, but then followed many of the others. And when they got there, they decided they wanted to set up a government. And who did they have in their ranks? They had a descendant of the house of David because Judah had two sons. One was called Zerah and the other was Perez. 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 Okay, Perez and Sarah. Perez stayed in the lineage inside of the land of Israel. But Zerah left. What do you know about Zerah when he was born? Was Zerah and Perez, what, what were they? They were twins. Right. Is that correct? Right. And which one? Zerah stuck his hand out first. Yes, put his hand out first and they tried a red string around, around it so they'd know yeah. who aimed out first. Yeah. It was important but because he was supposed to be the one. king. He's supposed to, be, <laughs> he's supposed to inherit all of the blessings. And he went back in. And what do you know? The other one came out first. And so David's people accepted Perez. Right. And most likely Zerah never went through the captivity in Egypt, right. or never went into bondage, let's put it that way. More than likely he left before that. And so here we go. What do, you, what do you find when you go to Ulster, Ireland? What do you find on one of their oldest government The red. You see a big... Uh, insignia up on the middle with a hand with a red string around it. Huh. Would you
you say Zara must have been there. Yeah. These are the proofs that our preachers won't talk about. That's right. But These a lot of people in England and Ireland do do know about all this teaching. We just don't know it here in the United States. Yeah. I mean, we used to. But the Lord said He would set them up, set this 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 twig, and they took this twig and Jeremiah and Baruch and these two daughters got off the boat in Ireland and one of the daughters, the oldest daughter I believe it was, that married the descendant of Zerah that was king. king here and, then, and from that time on, and by the way they, they used the stone, that, yeah. it's what they sat on when they put them in power. Mm -hmm. And from that point on they could not rule in England or in Great Britain unless they could prove that they descended from that line. Right. And That's we always had the genealogy of the kings, always. Right? Because they were the one people that always kept track of it. That's the reason you'll never see Prince Harry, uh, Prince, whatever the one is that's been in the news, or right. Charles, Charles and Andrew. the one. They're not qualified. You're not going to make them. They were not, they, they were born out of the line. And that's why they brought in Princess Di, or D. Right. And uh, Diana. that's why her first son is qualified, but he's not a descendant of, of Charles, who she was married to. You have to understand, these people monkeyed <laughs> with the genetics to make sure they got the right people. That's why she was killed, I'm sure. And uh, Harry, the one that married the, the other guy. The black one. The black one. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, he disqualified himself. There's pretty good evidence that his daddy was probably the head of the stable. Yeah. He'll never, he'll never be involved in the king's palace. And she's already, I think, been kicked out as far as I understand. I've read some articles lately. So anyway, brother, you have anything you want to add to this? We, I told him to look up some extra if he had it. Uh. Yeah. Okay. I wouldn't want to put it on the field. You done? Why don't you go ahead and close out and then we'll talk something. Okay. Well I can make a question. Yeah. I'll, I'll just go ahead. <clears throat> how does how do you say Princess Diana makes that lineage again? Where is she from? She is uh she's from the Welch, which would be uh, part of Israel, but she's not necessarily from David's line. So that uh, was her. But the uh, whoever the man was that they had involved wasn't her husband, but whoever the man was would have been proven to have been from the kings. So that's why. Okay. Okay, I'm going to close out my part. I'm going to let Brother Dave come and uh, he can talk for a few minutes.